Tonight's presentation, Failure to Rotate and Talking About Burn Valves. Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated and an author for numerous aviation publications, holds certified flight instructor certificate, A&P mechanic certificate with the IA privileges, uh, the 2008 FAA's Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year and a member of EAA. Mike, thank you so much for your information tonight. I'm going to turn control of the presentation over to you. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, good evening. I hope everybody had a nice Memorial Day weekend. I got to fly my airplane from California all the way out to, uh, to Indiana for Memorial Day and, and back. That was that was fun. It was a fast trip out. It was a slow trip back. <laughs> it tends to be the case. <clears throat> anyway, I'd like to talk to tonight about uh, burned exhaust valves and some of the stuff that we have been learning uh, in uh, recent times about exactly why they burn and what we can what we can do about it. Um, you know, uh, our piston aircraft engines have an awful lot of moving parts, um, and the thought of uh, thousands of these parts uh, reciprocating and rotating and wiggling, wobbling, and rubbing against one another thousands of times a minute might make you a bit nervous if you think about it too much. I try really hard not to think about it when I'm flying, but uh, every so often <laughs> it uh, it hits me that uh, there's an awful lot of stuff going on up there. Um, but the parts that make me most nervous are uh, are the, the ones that uh, can suddenly uh, cause you to uh, have to do an unscheduled uh, expensive engine teardown and the ones that can make you fall out of the sky. Now the ones that are most likely to cause you to uh, have to tear down the engine uh, when you didn't plan on it uh, are the cam and lifter interface. Most of the time that we have to tear down engines before TBO, it's because of, of a cam problem. But the ones that can make you fall out of the sky, the most likely one, <clears throat> are exhaust valves. Um, they're the most likely part of a aircraft engine to fail prematurely. And uh, they can ruin your way in at least two different ways. They can stick or they can burn. Now we talked about valve sticking in a previous webinar. Uh, I did a, a webinar on why valves stick that's in the uh, uh, in, in the EAA webinar archive. Um, uh, sticking is uh, is a problem that's much more common in Lycomings than in Continentals. Burning is a problem that happens in both kinds of engines, but some of more, is most more most more common in Continentals. Um, and we'll talk about uh, why that is, but we've been learning quite a bit uh, recently about um, about why the valves burn, and and uh, so I want to share uh, what we've learned with you. You know, when when exhaust valves burn, mechanics invariably blame the burned exhaust valves on pilot mismanagement of the power plant, and they they tell aircraft owners, well, don't don't lean so aggressively; it overheats the valves, causing them to burn. My, the, the, the classic line is, "Fuel is cheaper than engines." Um, and some some uh, experts, or self-proclaimed experts, anyway, uh, ad advise you to uh, to watch your exhaust gas temperatures and make sure they don't get too high. Uh, implication being that uh, EGT is a good proxy for exhaust valve temperature. Um, all of that is pretty much hogwash. Uh, for example, if high EGTs caused exhaust valves to burn, then low compression engines, which have much higher uh, EGTs than high compression engines do, uh, would have a lot more burn valves. And clearly that's not the case. And if aggressive leaning uh, caused exhaust valves to burn, then the two Continental TSI 0520s on my Cessna 310 that went to uh, about 230% of TBO um, and were operated uh, almost strictly lean at peak their whole life uh, would have burned a lot of valves. And in fact, they burned zero valves. So, so don't believe that stuff. 
Um, when exhaust valves burn, it's almost never the fault of the pilot. It's that that's just an old wives' tale. But it's not the pilot's fault. Whose fault is it? Well, the short answer is then it's generally the fault of the hardware. Um, and that's where the story gets really interesting. So we're gonna start talking about the hardware uh, of, of exhaust valves and uh, talk about why they, why they burn. So let's, uh, let's open the, 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 uh, the, the front cover of, of my uh, exhaust valve survival guide. You know, exhaust valves, um, have to survive in an atmosphere of incredibly hot and corrosive gas uh, whose temperature can reach 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit in the combustion chamber at the uh, peak pressure point of, of the combustion cycle. And to make matters worse, the valve uh, needs to um, move smoothly. The valve stem needs to move smoothly in and out of a valve guide pretty much without benefit of lubrication because uh, the stem runs so hot that engine oil would just carbonize if 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 we tried to to lubricate the the the, the interface between the the valve stem and the and the valve guide. So frankly, it's it's pretty much a miracle that these exhaust valves last <clears throat> as long as they do. Um, and how the the fact that they do last that long is um, uh, the result of some some pretty clever engineering. Um, key to the uh, survival of exhaust, exhaust valves is the, uh, the valve's ability to shed all this intolerable heat by transferring it from the valve to the cylinder head, which acts as a giant heat sink for the valve. Because um, the, no valve can withstand the, the you know, 4,000 degree temperatures. Um, so the valve needs to have a cooling strategy that causes it not not to not to heat up to four thousand degrees, but but to pass that heat on um, to the cylinder head, which is a very large uh, piece of thermal mass, uh, and and it's covered with cooling fins that uh, that are very effective at transferring the heat into to uh, to to the air that's that's uh, that's cooling the engine. So there there are two ways that then exhaust valve can transfer its heat to the cylinder head. It can do it via contact between the head of the valve and the valve seat. Of course, it can only do that when the valve is closed and it's in contact with the seat, but the valve is closed about two thirds of the time. Um, it also can transfer its heat to the cylinder head through, the, uh, through contact between the valve stem and the valve guide. Um, and of course, that interface is constantly there. Now, Continental and Lycoming employ subtly different construction and heat sinking strategies for their exhaust valves. And, and the, the, the fact that they do employ different strategies explains why uh, Lycoming valves stick more and burn less and Continental valves stick less and burn more. Um, continental valves um, are, are, they're solid, um, but they're made of a very exotic um, nickel chromium super alloy called mnemonic. Uh, that is, uh, it's, it's actually a, a close relevant, uh, relative to Inconel, and it's known for its very high temperature characteristics, um, can stand a lot of heat. Um, Lycoming valves, on the other hand, are, are made of less exotic alloys, uh, basically kinds of stainless steel. Um, but they have hollow stems that are partially filled with metallic sodium. Now, metallic sodium is an interesting substance uh, in that it, uh, at room temperature, it has the um, roughly the consistency of toothpaste, um, but it has an unusually low melting point. Uh, just 208 degrees Fahrenheit, so less than the, the, the boiling point of water, and it has very high boiling. Uh, uh, the the uh, metallic sodium has a very high boiling point, uh, over 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, and it has extremely good thermal conductivity. So 
th this um, metallic sodium that's inside of the hollow stems of Lycoming exhaust valves liquefies uh, as the valve starts to heat up and then sloshes back and forth inside the hollow valve stem um, uh, to transfer heat from the head in, into, uh, into the stem. Um, so it, 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 um, it changes the, uh, the entire temperature profile of the valve com compared to uh, whether it would, uh, compared to if it would be a, if, if it were a solid stem uh, valve like the Continentals. And this heat map um, kind of compares the, uh, the Continental solid stem valve uh, temperatures with the uh, sodium filled um, Lycoming valve temperatures. And, um, and, and as you can see, the, the Continental sheds more than 80% of its heat through the interface between the face of the valve and, and the seat, and, and all, less than 20% through the stem uh, to guide interface. Whereas Lycoming, um, because it conducts heat from the face of the valve to the, to the stem, um, transfers a lot more through the stem. In fact, it's about 50-50 between uh, heat transfer uh, to the to the um, the valve seat and heat transfer to the valve guide, and um, and the 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 edges of the valve um, uh, tend to be uh, cooler uh, in Lycomings and Continentals because of the this uh, this difference of heat transfer. So that's why in Lycomings. Um, having a close tolerance fit between the stem and the guide is very, very important to the survival of the valves. And why Lycoming is, is, um, is, is very uh, uh, obsessive about uh, checking uh, the cl clearance between the, 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 the valve and the guide uh, with the service bullet 388C rather, uh, that, 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 that calls for doing a, a wobble test um, every 400 hours or a thousand hours, depending on the uh, what kind of valves and guides are installed, to make sure that the uh, the the, the, uh, the 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 guide is not excessively worn, and also to make sure that there's not excessive deposit buildup inside between the 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 uh, the valve stem and the guide that can cause uh, sticking. Um, but half of the heat uh, load on that valve is transferred uh, between the stem and the guide. And so the, having a good uh, interface there uh, uh, between the, uh, the stem and the guide, a good close tolerance fit is very important on Lycomings. On the other hand, continental valves can usually cope pretty well with sloppy fitting valve guides, as long as the head of the valve is making a firm leak-free contact with the seat throughout its entire 360 degree circumference when the valve is closed, uh, because Continentals uh, shed 80% of their heat uh, through that interface with the seat and only, uh, only about 20% through the guide. So the, they're built differently and they have different uh, characteristics in terms of, of uh, uh, what causes them to um, to burn. So let's talk about threats to exhaust valve survival. Um, exhaust valve burn burn uh, burn when the, the heat transfer path from the valve to the cylinder head is compromised. Uh, if the valve loses its heat sink, it can overheat and start to warp and in some cases actually develop uh, what's called hoop stress cracking around the edges in severe cases. But usually it just warps and there's some metal erosion and um, that causes the valve to lose its seal with the seat, uh, ex uh, allowing these very hot combustion gases to, to leak past the valve during the hottest part of the combustion event when the valve is supposed to be completely closed. And if that very, very hot gas at, at up to 4,000 degree gas is leaking past the valve, it's going to 
um, uh, erode the, the metal and it's going to uh, uh, cause the, uh, the valve to warp. And once that happens, that makes the leak worse. And uh, so you get into this uh, death spiral where, where the, the, um, uh, the leakage uh, causes the, the valve to, to get sick and the sick valve causes the leakage to get greater. And you know, pretty soon uh, that valve is, is toast. Um, and if, if it's not caught in time, uh, the valve will typically, you know, shed a piece of, of metal, which will go out the exhaust usually. Sometimes it bounces around inside the cylinder and does some damage before it goes out the exhaust. Um, and uh, it, you know, shuts down the cylinder and causes the engine to run real rough. If, um, if it's a six cylinder engine, it, it runs rough enough that, that, that you're gonna probably land at the next airport. If it's a four cylinder engine, it runs rough enough that you might wind up putting having to put it down on a road um, either way you're going to have an underwear change and it's going to be a fairly traumatic event um, now sometimes burning of the exhaust valve premature burning is baked into the cake when the cylinder leaves the factory or, or comes back from the engine shop because if the the valve guide and valve seat are not perfectly concentric with one another then the valve won't seal perfectly around its circumference when the valve is closed. And um, this is an example of a, of, of a continental uh, cylinder with, with the exhaust valve removed um, that wasn't set up right, where, where there's significant lack of concentricity. And I put some crosshairs in there so you can see it between the, 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 the seat and the um, and the guide, and there's very uneven um, uh, wear on the on that seat. It, it, if you look around its circumference, you'll see it's very thin. There's a thin border on the left side and a thick border on the right side. Uh, and it turns out that that during the 90s, there was a period of years when the Continental Factory changed its its process. Um, the traditional thing that you do when you when you uh, manufacture a cylinder is is to to press fit the the your the the guides into the head you, you, they're actually the, the head is heated up and the guide is the guides are chilled in a refrigerator and then they're pressed into place in the head and and when the temperatures equalize there's an interference fit that holds that guide very firmly into the head casting and and then um Subsequently, the the uh, the guide is reamed with a tool that that uh, references to the seat to make sure that the guide and the seat are perfectly concentric with one another. But but Continental um, changed its process, and they stopped post reaming valve guides. They they decided that their 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 CNC tools were so accurate they didn't need to do that anymore. So they 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 reamed the the guides before installation, and then assumed because everything was supposed to be just right that 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 the concentricity would be there, and that turned out to be a pretty bad idea. And during that period of time, we started seeing large numbers of Continental cylinders that started burning exhaust valves after four or five hundred hours in service, and of course the the mechanics blamed the pilots and the pilots got a guilty conscience and said, oh, what did I do wrong? And in fact, they didn't do anything wrong. The, the cylinders came from the factory basically with, with a time bomb planted in them that virtually guaranteed that this was gonna happen. Uh, subsequently, Continental fessed up to their error and started post reaming uh, guides again the way they always had done in the past. And the problem largely went away. Um, when, when cylinders are overhauled, um, in the field, um, one of the things that they, they have to do is, is grind the, uh, the valve and the seat, uh, in order to make the proper contact between, between the, the valve and the seat. And that turns out to be a lot trickier than it sounds. The, the manual calls for the face of the valve to be 
ground at a slightly different angle, about one degree different angle than the seat, to provide a narrower contact footprint that will seal better with a, with, with a higher pressure gradient when the valve is closed. This uh, slide shows a kind of expanded by diagram of how that's supposed to work, where the the, the seat is is ground at a at a 45 degree angle and the valve face is is ground at a 44 degree angle um, and the, there's a contact area there that is smaller than it would be if the, the two were were ground at the same angle and that smaller contact area is supposed to be um, more resistant to resistant to any kind of leakage than if the two were were ground at the same area but that turns out to be um, more uh, art than science to get that right. If the contact area is too wide, uh, the valve won't seal well, but if it's too narrow, then the heat transfer path between the, the valve face and the valve seat is compromised. So it, it, it has to be just like, just perfect uh, to, to solve both of the problems of, of having good heat transfer path, but also good sealing. And that turns out to be quite difficult. Some engine shops do a better job of it than others. Um, and uh, some shops have have tricks that they use where, where, where they grind two different angles into the into the seat and so on and so forth. So it's but it's 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 a lot more complicated than you would think. Um, and Getting this right is particularly important in the case of continental valves because they're so dependent on that face to seat heat transfer path that more than 80% of the, of the heat load on the valve has to get transferred that way. Uh, the Lycoming uh, sodium filled valves are, are much more dependent on, on the stem to guide interface uh, being good. So, you know, worn guides that have a sloppy fit, uh, that get bell mouthed uh, in, in in service, uh, can lead to burn valves and lycomings. Whereas continentals are much more tolerant of uh, sloppy fit because they don't transfer that much heat uh, uh, via the stem. So this is one reason why lycoming recommends this regular wobble testing uh, service bullet in 388C, where you. You, you take off the valve springs and you you hook up a special fixture and you 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 measure exactly how much the valve can can be wobbled inside the guide. If you can, if 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 the wobble is too small, there's actually a minimum and maximum in in the service bullet. And if the wobble is too small, then it means that that the deposits have been have built up on the valve stem and inside the guide. And, uh, the, and and that buildup can can lead to valve sticking. On the other hand, if the wobble is too great, it means that the guide is excessively worn, and in either case, uh, remedial action is uh, is called for. But then there's an, a, another cause of burned valves, um, particularly in continentals, um, that that hasn't been discussed very much, um, and that's failure to rotate. Um, the the uh, uh, rotation is, is is essential to exhaust valve survival. Most continentals and Lycomings employ exhaust valve rotators that cause the valve to rotate just a fraction of a degree every time the valve um, opens and closes. Um, Lycoming calls them rotator caps. Continental calls them rotocoils. They basically accomplish the same thing. And at typical cruise RPMs, uh, the exhaust valves typically will rotate a whole 360 degree rev revolution about once a minute, um, plus or minus, but that in that general attitude uh, uh, area. So, so they rotate quite slowly, um, but, but, but about every minute, the valve completes a complete rotation. Now the purpose of exhaust valve rotation is, is twofold. First of all, it, it ensures that the heat load is spread evenly and symmetrically um, around the circumference of the valve um, 
in, instead of one part of the valve always being in a, in, a, in a hot part of the combustion chamber, another part of the valve being in a cooler part of the combustion chamber. So it gives it gives each part of the of the valve's uh, face circumference uh, equal equal opportunity to, to 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 face the heat. And secondly, it it helps prevent the formation of deposits on the valve seat that can prevent good sealing between the valve and the seat. Uh, the, the the rotating action um, tends to scrub the the valve seat. Uh, uh, clean of deposits um, and it, 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 it reduces the, it doesn't eliminate completely, but it reduces the formation of these uh, deposits of, of uh, uh, exhaust uh, deposits on the, on the valve seat. So in recent years, we've been finding an increasing number of burned valves that we have traced to failure of the rotator, particularly in continental engines. And a lot of the research on this has been done by a colleague of mine uh, named Dave Pasquale, uh, who, who runs a, a, a shop called Pasquale Aviation, Pottstown, Pennsylvania. And uh, he's done a lot of research on this, has taken a lot of, uh, and a number of the photos that I'm using in this presentation came from, from Dave. But uh, Dave is the, is the master of the borescope and uh, has uh, uh, detected a lot of these problems. and. Um, and and so we're quite indebted to to Dave's work in terms of uh, discovering this. Anyway, the, con the continental rotocoil contains a, a spring called a garter spring um, that that it gets squished every time the valve opens, it, and the squishing kind of causes the spring coils to to deflect sideways as they get squished down. And that squishing action is what actually causes the rotation um, of the valve. Unfortunately, that same squishing action also causes the spring to wear, where where it's in contact with the uh, uh, with the case of the of, of the rotocoil. And um, here's a, a a better picture of it. But the top spring is uh, is is one that's new and the bottom spring is one that's been in service for a while and you can see that that flat spotting that occurs uh, on the spring when it wears and um, once it wears enough um, the rotocoil stops stops working uh, stops rotating and um, it, once that happens it doesn't take long for the non-rotating valve to develop a hot spot and eventually start to burn. Um, and if it's not caught, uh, it will burn beyond salvation and the cylinder will have to come off and get sent out for revalving. Um, well, why are we seeing this more often than we used to? Well, we're not totally sure about that, but we've got kind of a theory um, because it turns out that the Continental's vendor for these rotocoils uh, which is a, a called it used to be TRW. It's, it's the company is now called Federal Mogul. The same the same company was acquired, uh, but they made some subtle changes to the rotocoil um, that seems to have adversely affected its longevity. And it turns out that there was a part number change. The older one, uh, which was part number six twenty nine one one seven used a larger diameter garter spring, but the current rotocoil, which is part number 652112 for, the, for, for, for you geeks, um, uses a smaller diameter garter spring that seems to uh, not last as long. And I don't know why they made that change, um, but, uh, and there wasn't very much publicity uh, associated with it. Uh, but it, but it, it seems that the, the, that the newer ones um, uh, stop working uh, uh, more uh, sooner than the than the older ones did. Uh, the good news is it's pretty easy to detect exhaust valves that have stopped rotating by inspecting them with a bore scope. And if you inspect them with a bore scope often enough, you can catch them early. Um, and if you catch them early, uh, you can solve the problem simply by replacing the rotator and, and lapping the valve in place, and you'll not have to take the cylinder off. So just to illustrate that, here's 
here, here's a series of photos of, of continental exhaust valves. Um, and the ones marked A and B um, are the way we want them to look. You can see that they have a, a, a nice symmetrical, kind of a bullseye looking pattern of exhaust deposits. And it's the symmetry that tells us that the, the, that the valve has, an, has equal heating all around the circumference of the valve. The difference between A and B is that in the case of A, the pilot operated the engine pretty lean, probably lean a peak. In the case of B, he operated it probably rich a peak, so there are a lot more deposits. But it's not the, the color of the deposits or anything like that that we're interested in, it's the symmetry. And both of those are, are nice symmetrical patterns and, and both of those valves look very good. And when you get to exhaust valve C, uh, it, 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 you, you can see that it's not nearly as symmetrical. It's not in, in real bad shape yet, um, but it's very suspicious. And it looks like it very well may have stopped rotating, or at least maybe it's rotating intermittently or something like that. Um, but you aren't seeing that clear symmetrical bullseye pattern on C anymore. And when you get to, to D and E, that it's it's very clear that those valves are are, are in trouble. Um, D is probably still a good candidate for lapping in place. E looks like it's pretty badly burned and and uh, the cylinder might need to come off. Um, so we want to bore scope the cylinders regularly, looking for this pattern, looking for this the, the symmetry. And when we start to see it uh, degrading, that's that's the time that we that we ought to do something about it because we probably can save the valve rather than um, rather than having to pull the cylinder and have and have it revalved, which is a an expensive proposition and also somewhat risky because every any time we remove and reinstall a cylinder, we, we run some risk of, of, of a problem and some catastrophic failures. Um, and once the valve starts rotating again, it, it's, it's, it can, it's very dramatic how quickly it can heal itself. Here's, here's an amazing picture that I got from a friend of mine, Dr. Gary Silver, MD, who, who's an A&P mechanic and uh, flies a Cessna 421 that he maintains himself. And he, he caught a, uh, an exhaust valve. Uh, that left picture is the, is the picture the, that, that he took uh, when he discovered it. And it actually looks pretty bad. It looks almost like it, uh, when I looked at that, I, I kind of thought, well, maybe that's beyond remediation. But he, um, he, he lapped the valve in place. He replaced the rotor coil took another bore scope image 1.7 hours later and uh, the, 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 the signs of the hotspot um, disappeared completely. And I suspect that, that if he took another image, um, you know, after 10 or 15 hours, he would probably have seen a nice bullseye pattern on that, on that valve. So, so that, that valve that looked like it was pretty, pretty badly burned uh, got 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 saved just by lapping and, and replacing the rotor coil. Um, Lycomings, we don't see as many rotator failures in Lycomings. They use a different style of, of uh, rotator. They call them rotator caps and they are, do look like little caps that that go over the, the tip of the of the valve. Um, but they do fail occasionally. This is one that did. And if you look at it closely, you can see that the wear pattern uh, on the top of the of the rotator cap, which where the rocker arm contacts uh, contacts it, has a a, a linear, a, a pretty significant wear depression which would only happen if this thing wasn't rotating. If it was rotating properly, then th then th what we would see is a nice swirl pattern on the top of this thing without any kind of a, a, of, of a you know, linear 
uh, groove. <laughs> but in this case, it stopped rotating, and it, it obviously had not been rotating for a while because the rocker had worn a, a, a linear groove uh, in the uh, you know across the the, the the top of the rotator cap where 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 it came in con where the foot of the of the rocker comes in ro in uh, contact with with the, with the rotator. So um, this one failed, and um, uh, the valve had started burning. Um, and uh, after lapping and a new rotator tater cap was put on, this was one that, uh, that, that Dave's shop did. Uh, a subsequent borescope image showed that the, uh, the, the, the burn spot um, had resolved. And uh, uh, I, again, my, my guess is that, that the subsequent uh, image would, would show kind of the restoration of that nice bullseye pattern that we. Uh, that we like to see that, that kind of reinforces the notion that the valve has a nice symmetrical uh, uh, heat, heat pattern to it. So just to kind of wrap up uh, before we do some Q&A, some takeaways from this presentation, burn valves aren't your fault. Don't, don't beat yourself up over them. They're always, almost always some kind of a hardware problem. Uh, they can be the way the cylinder was set up in the first place. Uh, they they can be um, uh, a, a rotator failure, um, but they're they're very seldom the fault of the the way the pilot is operating the engine, contrary to uh, popular belief. Uh, if you bore scope the cylinders frequently, um, every at least every hundred hours. If if you could do it every fifty hours, like every oil change, that would be wonderful. But at least every hundred hours, um, you can you can catch valve issues early and avoid the need for uh, cylinder removal by, by, by lapping the valve in place rather than pulling the cylinder and changing the valve out. Uh, the bore scope will show whether the valve is a viable candidate for lapping, how, how far gone it is. If you do lap the valve, always replace the rotator. The rotators are cheap and you should just replace them on general principles particularly the continental ones, because uh, lately they seem to have a somewhat limited uh, useful life to them. Um, and then a follow-up bore scope inspection 10 or 25 hours later after, after you've done the lapping and the, and the uh, rotator replacement will hopefully confirm that you dodged the bullet and that the valve is now looking nice and healthy under the bore scope. But pulling the cylinder should always be the last resort. We don't like to pull cylinders unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, and <clears throat> with that, Tim, why don't we uh, why don't we open it up for, for some Q and A? Okay, Mike. Thank you for that presentation. That was awesome. Great uh, graphics and uh, very very nicely done. Very riveting uh, presentation. Uh, let's start with. Michael, he's wondering about, and a couple of people have asked this, about the superior millennium cylinders. Do they display the same exhaust valve traits as the OEM manufacturers, Continental, continental or Lycoming? Uh, yeah, pretty much identical, really. Um, the, the, they, I, 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 I will say that back in the 90s when Continental was having all of those problems because they stopped uh, uh, post reaming their valve guides the the con the the superior cylinders weren't having that problem because superior was was making them the the, the same old way that they always used to with with post ream guides but um I, I believe that that superior and continental use the same vendor federal mogul for their for their uh the rotators as do cummins cummins diesel and lots of other companies uh, they seem to have pretty much a corner on the market of, of these rotators. So uh, I don't think there's any any difference. Um, I recently replaced a rotator on uh, on, on my airplane and I, I used a, a superior rotator rather than a continental rotator because the superior ones are a lot cheaper, but I think they're absolutely identical. I think they come from the same vendor. Chris was wondering, is there a metal metallurgical difference between the valve and the valve seats? Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. The 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 seats are uh, are, are are definitely not made of uh, of uh, 
mnemonic alloy. They're, uh, and they don't need to be because because they're they're constantly. I mean, they're press fit into the head. Um, so you know they have a, they have the world's best heat sink. They they the the, the seat never gets that hot. I mean, <laughs> I I wouldn't want to touch one or anything while the engine was operating. But you know they don't get in, up, up into the temperature range that the that the exhaust valve does. The the exhaust valve, I mean it it goes under its maximum heat stress when the valve is open and it's it's lost uh, that that very important heat sink and all of this hot stuff is 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 going past it. So that that's when the exhaust valve really you know. Is under tremendous heat stress, and and of course the seat never has has that happen. It's it's always well heat synced. Neil is wondering, will the leakage of the exhaust valve cause detonation? No, no, that has nothing to do with it at all. Um, uh, the, the the leakage past the exhaust valve will 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 simply cause big problems for the exhaust valve. And Gary says, um, you've been focused on the exhaust valves. Aren't the intake valves subjected to the same stresses? Um, no, the, 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 um, if, if, you know, as I said, the, 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 the valve is most heat stressed when it's open. And if you think about when the intake valve is open, the intake valve is open at, the, at a very cool part of the cycle. Where, where all of the, the 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 exhaust gas from the previous combustion event has has been shoved out the back door, and cool air that that's that's even further cooled because it's got fuel atomized into it, it is is being sucked into the cylinder. So the intake valve, you know, basically gets refrigerated when it's opened. <laughs> In, in a way, uh, it doesn't get heated when it's open. The exhaust valve is the one that, that, that has all the heat problems. And I, I don't think I've ever seen a case where, where an intake valve um, burned. It, once in a great while, you'll, you'll develop a problem with an intake valve, but it's very rare and it's, it's not generally heat related. Jeff was wondering, how often should the wobble test be performed on a lycoming engine? Well, you, you need to reference uh, service bullet SB 388C, and, and it has uh, two recommended intervals. One is every 400 hours, and the other is every 1,000 hours. And, and which one applies to your engine depends um, on, on what kind of, uh, of, of valving it has. Um, I, I think that the the recommendation may be different between parallel and 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 uh, angle valve engines. Um, I don't I don't have the service bulletin in front of me, but but if you consult with the service bulletin, it will be obvious which of the two intervals, 400 hours or 1,000 hours, applies to your engine. Merrick was wondering, does the seat also wear or just the valve? Um, well, we're not really talking about wear in the traditional sense of, you know, of, of friction and wear where, where micro welds between the, 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 comp the components cause, cause metal erosion. That's not really what's going on. Uh, the, the seat that does wear a little bit um, in service. Um, the, the valve wears a, a little bit in service, although it's it's made of very hard stuff. Um, generally, uh, it, the it, the guide is is what wears the most in that whole system, um, uh, because it, it it in most cases is the softest of the of the materials. Um, but the the guide does, you know, when when a valve is replaced, the 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 guide is inspected. In some case, it's changed out if it's if it's uh, got a you know has a problem, um, and uh, 
and sometimes it's it's left in place but just reground with a special tool that restores its uh it's 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 finished and it's uh, and, and the you know the, the that angle that it's supposed to be ground to that 45 degree angle and uh, merrick wonders how can i how can we test a rotator well it's it i i just actually did that um on on my engine uh when i was doing the annual i had one cylinder that looked a little funky and I suspected that it had stopped rotating, and I did wind up lapping it and replacing the rotator. But um, there's a couple of ways of of doing it. One one is uh, maybe the simplest way is to is to take the um, uh, the rocker cover off, so so you're exposing the the you know the the valve train. And get out a sharpie and put a mark on the on the rotator, uh, a reference mark. And then you have two choices. You can either you you can either put the 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 rocker cover back on and then go run the engine for a while and then take the rocker cover off and see if it moved. Or you can do what I did, which is to is, is to simply get a rubber mallet and and beat on the rocker to 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 open and close the valve just a tiny bit a bunch of times. And uh, if, if the rotator is working, every time you hit it with a mallet, it will rotate a tiny little bit. It's hard, hard to, to see because it's a tiny fraction of a degree. But if you if you strike it with the mallet, you know, 40 or 50 times, you should see some some rotation. Uh, so you can do it that way, or you can actually run the engine and then and then uh, pull a rocker cover again and see if the if if the mark that you made has rotated. But that's those are the the, the best ways to do it. Uh, Anders is wondering: Do rotators have an expected life limit? Not that anybody's published. <laughs> no, I suppose somebody could say, "Well, TBO or something." I don't know. Um, but like I said, we we very seldom used to see them fail and we're seeing them fail a lot more often now um, and i have a feeling it has to do with this with this change that was made uh putting in a smaller spring which i don't know why they did that but they did a few people were wondering approximately like what date that happened you know i i i don't know exactly um it's possible that dave might have an idea of actually I asked him and he wasn't really sure um, but I, I wonder if it's if there's some good way of researching that I, re, I I wish I knew when when they made that change I don't I really don't know Ron is asking uh, during the leak down test if I hear any air flow through the exhaust pipe should I lap the valve and secondly when I lap the valve should I lap the intake also? Um, well, if if you're doing if you're doing a leak down test or or what we mostly most people call a compression test, leak down test is actually a better better word for it. Um, and and you hear um, air coming out the exhaust valve. Uh, uh, the first thing to do probably is is kind of what I was just talking about, which is to take the rocker cover off and and with the cylinder pressurized um you know hit, hit the, the the rocker with a mallet a couple of times to joggle a valve and see if you can get it to seal a little bit better it's called staking the valve i don't know what, where that terminology came from but that's what everybody calls it and if if you can't get the leakage to stop and the compression to to come up by doing that um then it might be worth lapping the valve but I, I, the, my inclination nowadays is to is is not to pay that much attention to compression tests, but to use the the bore scope to tell me what the condition of the valve is. It's it's just a much more discriminating tool. Um, but we we would want I you know I I recently had a valve that looked a little bit funky. The compression reading had. It dropped down to 58 over 80, which Continental says is a perfectly respectable compression reading for a big board Continental. But the valve just looked 
a little funky to me. It just looked like it was, didn't look like any of the other 11 <laughs> valves in my two engines. It, it, it just looked like it had stopped rotating. And so I made a decision to, uh, to, to lap the valve, you know, prophylactically rather than to let it get any worse and change out the rotator cap after I'd lapped the valve. Uh, I got a cold compression reading of 71 as opposed to the hot compression reading of 58 that I had before. And I could not hear any air coming out the exhaust. So I just flew the airplane to Indiana and back. And, uh, and next week I'm, I'm gonna take the top spark plug out and put the bore scope in and see, see what that valve looks like after, uh, after putting some hours on it. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that it's going to start looking a lot more normal than it did before. Um, I don't know and, if that answered the question, but anyway, I, 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 I rely more on the bore scope uh, that, than I do on, on a compression reading. And, and the second part of that question from Ron was, um, should I also lap the intake valve? Um, I, I, I would not bother to lap the intake valve unless there's some some leakage past the intake valve, which again is not very common. Usually intake valves are pretty trouble free. Um, if I mean if you if you did a leak down test and you did hear air leaking out, out the uh, the in, the induction system, um, that would probably probably be worth trying to to lap that valve. But I but that's pretty rare that, 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 they, that you'd hear that. And Jeff was wondering, what does lapping the valve do? Is it cleaning deposits off the head and the valve stem? Um, well, it, 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 it's, actually, it's actually grinding the metal a little bit. It's uh, basically the lapping compound is, is a, a heavy grease in, into which um, um, abrasive particles have been mixed, and uh, and it's uh, it, it's just it's de it basically is designed to to restore the the, the good contact between the, the the valve and the seat um, without having to remove them and putting them on a you know on a grinding machine. Uh, but to do it in place, and if the if the valve is not in too bad shape, then then it then it will work. If the valve is in real bad shape, then uh, nothing short of taking it out and grinding it will will restore it. But um, that's that's why we try to make an assessment with the bore scope, you know, whether whether the valve is salvageable or whether it, whether the cylinder really needs to come off. But you know, Mike attitude towards it is you know what do you have to lose by by lapping the valve if, if you lap it and you fly 10 hours and it still looks sick you always have the option to pull a cylinder um, so the, the, and lapping it is such as a simple non-invasive quick procedure um, somebody who's experienced can you know not knock off a, a lapping exhaust valve in an hour or so um that it's to my way of thinking it's always worth trying that first before getting into something more invasive than involves cylinder removal tom was wondering is it best to bore scope the exhaust valve with the valves closed or open both um when when, when we bore scope we 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 run the to run the prop around and 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 put the valve through its entire cycle. Um, you can, with the valve closed, what you're looking at is the is the exhaust deposit pattern on the face of the valve that that kind of acts as a almost like a temperature map. Uh, but with the valve open, you can actually see uh, if you have a really good bore scope. Um, and a really good bore scope only costs about two hundred fifty dollars, so there's no excuse not to have a really good bore scope nowadays. Um, but you can actually see, you should be able to see the 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 contact line around the valve, and uh, 
that should be a nice unbroken contact line. And if, if there are areas where the contact line disappears, then, then you know that the valve is making good contact and some, some part of it. Um, but uh, uh, I, I've got a video on YouTube um, that I did while I was doing this valve lapping recently um, uh, during my uh, annual inspection. And uh, uh, it, it's got some very stunningly high resolution borescope images that I took, both, some, both stills and, and, and movies um, that will give you an idea of, of just how much detail you can see with a good borescope. Uh, but it's, uh, it's really pretty amazing what, what, a, what, what you can see with a good HD borescope. Stephen wonders, can you recommend a bore scope for an aircraft owner? I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, the bore scope that I use and that I recommend now is uh, the Vividia, V I V I D I A, V I V I D I A. Yeah, that's right. Um, model VA 400L, as in Lima. Um, I recommend uh, ordering it directly from the manufacturer, which is Oasis Scientific. Um, they have a store, um, a web store. And um, uh, make sure that you're ordering the, the, the high definition version and make sure you, it has the L suffix, which denotes that it has a locking feature on the, on the plunger that, that uh, varies the viewing angle of the, of the camera. Um, because for some reason, if some reason, that locking feature always used to be standard, and then they 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 stopped, they they took it off, and uh, everybody complained bitterly, and so they they added it back. Uh, if you order it with an L suffix, so you definitely want to order it that way. But a VA 400L from Oasis Scientific, just a a, a spectacularly good bore scope for two hundred and fifty dollars. Grover is wondering, can engine data analysis find rotator problems? Um, that is a wonderful question uh, to which I do not know the answer because we we have a uh, for the last year or so we we've deployed a very sophisticated uh, machine learning based um, failing exhaust valve detection uh, system, which seems to have a pretty good track record of uh, of detecting exhaust valves that are potentially in failure. Um, it's a screening test. It's not a it's it's not a diagnostic test. It 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 only tells you that you have a higher than normal probability of failure. You really need to use a bore scope to to verify the diagnosis. But if 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 the if the FEVA uh, report says that that you have a cylinder that uh, is uh, at above average risk of failure, then we recommend not waiting till the next annual to do the bore scope, but to do it at the next reasonable opportunity, like the next oil change. Uh, so that you will verify whether the whether whether the valve does have a problem, and if so, you'll catch it as early as possible. Um, but um, the, the the weird thing about machine learning is that it doesn't tell you why it came to the conclusions it did, <laughs> and so. Uh, you know, it 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 will it it gives every valve that it looks at um, a score, a risk score, but it doesn't say here's why I gave this a, an above average risk score. So we're not really sure why it does what it does. It's 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 sort of a black box that we've run, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of of flights into to train and, uh, but 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 it doesn't really tell us why it's uh, coming up with the with the scores that it does that 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 it does but what we what we do know is that 
um, on average throughout the fleet, uh, an exhaust valve has about a, a two or three percent chance, roughly one in thirty or something, of of being in 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 failure, not not failed, but in the process of failing, uh, detectably uh, process of failing. If you, in other words, if you looked at it with a boroscope, you'd see that it looked that that, that it didn't look healthy. So about about one in thirty across the fleet. If if the if the machine learning algorithm flags a cylinder as being at above average risk, then it has about a one in four chance of being in failure. So it's kind of like a PSA. And if it if it flags it as below average risk, it has a, a one in hundred chance of failure. So it's kind of like a PSA test. If if you have a, a high PSA, it doesn't necessarily mean you, you have prostate cancer, but it means you really ought to uh, get a biopsy or something to take a look at it because you have a, a higher than average chance of having prostate cancer and that's the same sort of a uh, same sort of a, of, a, of a test. John says I have a lycoming O320 E2D and use auto fuel. Will the valve show the same wear heat pattern as when 100 low lead fuel is used in that engine? Uh, yeah, we've, we, well, it, it won't show the same heat pattern be, because you won't have as anywhere near as, as, as many nasty exhaust deposits on your combustion chamber components if you're using unleaded auto gas compared to if you're using 100 low lead. 100 low lead is, is, is very dirty stuff. The, 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 the lead creates all sorts of deposits and stuff. Uh, but it, in terms of, of, Valve train longevity, we've seen no sign whatsoever that uh, um, that there are any uh, additional problems using using unleaded auto fuel. In fact, uh, if if anything, the evidence is it points the other way. And you know the Rotax engine is perfect example where where the Rotax engine wants to be run in unleaded mo gas, and and they will. It will tolerate 100 low lead, but if you use 100 low lead more than just occasionally, then you've got to have the oil change interval, and you've got to do more gearbox inspections and stuff because the 100 low lead is is pretty nasty stuff compared with the unleaded mo gas. Chris asks, regards to valve rotation on Continentals, what about the smaller engines that don't have rotator? coils such as the O200 and O300 series. Yeah, you know, I I don't know why those those older design Continentals didn't have rotators on them, but but you're right, they don't they don't have them. Uh and actually those engines my experience with them is is that they act almost more like Lycomings. They they have a lot more problems with stuck valves, whereas stuck valves are literally unheard of in, in, in the big bore continental engines. So they, they just have a very different valve train um, uh, metallurgy and so on. Um, and I don't have a lot of experience with the with the O200s and O300s, but but I do know that we that we run into stuck valves with them regularly, which we often do with Lycomings, but almost never do with the, with the bigger bore Continental engines. Hmm. Ron says, I watched your video of lapping the valve. How much care should I take getting the lapping compound cleaned out? Well, that's a good question. I, I know there are a lot of people who are really obsessive about getting the, getting the, the that lapping compound cleared out. My own feeling is it's not terribly important. Um, the 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 uh, lapping compound consists of of uh, as I said heavy grease with some ab abrasive uh, mixed in with it, and that that stuff is going to instantly get incinerated and and uh, and shoved out the exhaust the minute the engine starts, uh, and uh, as long as you take enough care not to spatter it all over the place and, and, and you know get it on the on the cylinder barrel which 
using the technique that I showed in the video with the, with the, the bent swab applicators, it would be very hard to do that. Um, but as long as you just, you know, you know, get a little excess maybe on the on the cylinder head and so on. I, I don't think it 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 really pays to get obsessive about trying to clean it because it's all gonna it's all gonna just uh, vaporize in combustion the minute the engine started. Uh, you know, I I use some some brake cleaner on a swab to try to clean off as much of the excess as I could, but I wasn't worried about the fact that I couldn't get it all off. I just didn't think it was very important. Michael says, so the lead doesn't do anything for helping sealing of the valves. Is it an old wives' tale? It's a total, total old wives' tale. It, uh, it's just I, I hear it so often that somehow or other lead is needed to lubricate the valves. You know, the, that's just that that just isn't true. Uh, all all the lead does is contribute to stuck to to sticking valves. It's it, as far as we can tell it. I mean, it's a it's it's very good octane booster, which means that it, it's very effective at inhibiting detonation, um, which is uh, particularly important in high compression engines. But everything else about it is bad, <laughs> and uh, um, it, I, I think I think we're going to have a lot less less maintenance issues once we get off of, of this hundred low lead stuff and onto unleaded fuel. So I'll, I'll be happy to see that happen uh, of course i fly a, a turbocharged airplane so uh, i can't use mo gas i can't use 94 ul i really need 100 octane fuel but once 100 octane uh, drop in replacement fuel like the like the gammy product or something becomes available i will be the very first on my block to be using it in my in my airplane Robert's wondering, can you recommend a valve spring compressor? He says, um, I can't lap the valve if you don't have a valve spring compressor tool, and I need to lap the valve on a Baron. Yeah, you know, the, there's uh, uh, there's some some specially designed for for aircraft engine valve spring compressors, and when I was in need of one during this annual inspection because I decided I was going to to lap the valve and change the rotator. Um, all of them were, were were back ordered for indeterminate periods of time. Aircraft tool supply was out of theirs and stuff, and I wound up I wound up uh, buying a, a an automotive one and it and it seemed to work fine. Uh, it's it was it's a it was probably a little less elegant than than the the purpose made aviation one, but. But uh, I, I just I just bought bought an a, a, a uh, automotive valve spring compressor off of Amazon and and it and it, it it had a bunch of, dip of of adjustments you could make make to it and I kind of adjusted it in a way that worked fine on on my aircraft engine. But aircraft tool supply makes what looks like a very nice compressor. It's just that they they were they were out of stock on them at the time I needed one. Kurt says, if an owner found one bad rotator, should uh, it be wise to replace the rotators on the other cylinders also? Uh, you know, it depends on your maintenance philosophy. You know, I'm I'm a, a, a an avowed maintenance minimalist that believes in doing things on condition, and because it's so easy to check with a bore scope, um, uh, my inclination would be to only change the rotators on valves that look like they've stopped rotating um, but you know there's a whole different maintenance philosophy that, that's much more maximalist uh, that, that says well let's do them all the, the, you know that's that the same philosophy is when uh, uh, mechanics who, who find you know one low compression cylinder and talk the owner into doing a top overhaul and saying well you know this one's gone so the other ones are probably going to follow us uh, soon, which is totally not true in my experience. In my experience, the, a six-cylinder engine is six one-cylinder engines, you know, flying in loose formation with one another, and what happens to one has nothing to do with what's going to happen to the others. But it's just that's just a matter of philosophy. My philosophy is is change the ones that 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 are demonstrably ill. 
Drew said, you said rotators are cheap. Is that like $1, $10 or $100 each? Oh, I'm trying to remember, but uh, it, the, the number that's popping into my head is about 25 bucks for a superior rotator uh, uh, rotor coil for continental engine. Don't, don't hold me to that, but that's that's the order of magnitude, I think. I think I think that you bought it from Continental, it was probably 50 bucks. But it's, you know, if in, I always think in terms of basic airplane units, which are $1,000 each. So this is <laughs> a small fraction of a basic airplane unit. So it's not expensive. Uh, I don't think that way with my Challenger, Mike. No, uh, oh, okay. Well, yeah, fair enough. A little different fair, sort of flying. Fair enough. Maybe yeah. your basic airplane is $100 for that. Yeah, that $20 <laughs> bill. Okay, anyways, David says, um, if the borescope burn color looks iffy, should you have the spring replaced also or wait? Um, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't replace the spring. And unless there's some evidence that stuff up in the rocker area is getting hot, you know, if there's if there's exhaust stains in there, if there's a lot of carbon in there when you take the rocker cover off or something, then then conceivably you might want to think about replacing the valve springs. But you know, valve springs don't don't wear out really when they when they go bad. It's usually because a bunch of exhaust got up into the rocker area because the the guide got real sloppy and and allowing exhaust to to get up there. And usually that leaves a lot of telltale carbon and stuff up there. So I, again, being a maintenance minimalist who tends to only change stuff when there's a good reason to do it, um, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't do it unless I saw some evidence that might lead me to believe that the, the valve springs were, were getting cooked. John says, it okay, is it okay to use upper cylinder lubricant and maybe this other question by Andre goes with it. Do you have any opinions of using Alcor TCP fuel treatment when running under low lead in like Cummins or Continental? Well, I'm not sure what upper cylinder lubricant is. As far as I know, the, uh, our, our engine oil is what lubricates our cylinders and including the the valve train because there's there's oil squirts up 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 in the rocker area that, that that puts oil especially on the exhaust valve to keep it cool it doesn't really lubricate very much but it but at least it's used as a coolant as far as the tcp is concerned um, uh, that's that's um, a, uh, a a lead scavenging agent and um, th there is already a lead scavenging agent called ethylene dibromide blended into uh, 100 low lead uh, so we don't normally use uh, have to use TCP uh, because the lead scavenging agent that's blended into pre-blended into the fuel does does the job. But if you do have an engine that for whatever reason, usually it's a, it'd be an engine where the combustion temperatures are unusually low, and the ethylene dibromide is not doing an adequate job of scavenging lead, and you, you're running into lead fouling problems with spark plugs and stuff that you can't cure simply by leaning more aggressively, particularly on the ground, uh, then uh, TCP, adding TCP to the fuel um, might help uh, as providing additional lead scavenging. Um, the, the only caution I would give you is that the TCP is, uh, is pretty toxic, so be careful about using it. Don't let it splash on yourself or anything and if you're carrying tcp in the airplane if you're carrying it in the cabin you might want to seal it up in a ziploc bag or something so that there's no likelihood that it's going to leak drew says i've witnessed failure at the neck on several lycoming valves what causes this or is it merely what happens as non-rotating valve fails? Um, that is a, a known problem with, uh, with, with, with lycoming valves. Uh, sometimes when they get up 
you know, close to 2,000 hours, they'll they'll start to to develop metal erosion on the uh, in in that area of the stem. I don't think it has anything to do with rotation or failure of rotation. I, I think it just has to do with the, the the fact that the lycoming valves are not made of as high temperature alloy as the continental valves, and that that they're subject to to heat damage after a long period of time. But I'm not a metallurgist. I'm not really an expert on that. That's that's uh, uh, my 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 best guess as to why it happens. But I do know that lycoming valves do have a history of of of, uh, of erosion, metal erosion in, in in that area when they get to pretty high time in service. Alan wonders, what software do you use with your borescope, the AV400? Oh, um, well, it, 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 if, you, if you plug it into a laptop, it'll basically work with, with, with any kind of camera software because it's just a USB camera. Uh, I tend to use, um, use it with my iPhone a lot. And I have a, I bought the, the Vividia um, uh, iPhone adapter, which basically uh, it, it powers the borescope with a rechargeable battery and also uh, provides a Wi-Fi interface uh, that, that I can use with the iPhone. And um, there's some app that I, that, that I use, I cannot remember the name of it, uh, that that is what is the app that they recommend with the uh, with that with that iPhone adapter. Uh, but when I use it on the computer, I just I just use some some camera uh, app because it just acts like a, a regular camera. Grover had made a comment. He said the um, the VA four hundred only works with a Wi Fi adapter on iPhones, and he said right. he found out the hard way and had to spend another hundred dollars on top of the cost of the borescope to get the adapter. Yeah, I'm um, I'm I'm not sure that's a hundred percent true because I think there is such a thing as a USB adapter for an iPhone, but the the the, uh, the solution that Bavidia provides is 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 this um, a hundred dollar adapter that you're talking about that that not only um, uh, provides a Wi-Fi interface that will, will work with an iPhone, but also uh, has a a, um, a a a pretty good rechargeable battery in here that runs the the bore scope, so that it, it's 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 pretty much a completely wireless operation. The bore scope is powered by this by this thing uh, without having to be plugged in. Uh, the previous generation that I had it. There was a Wi-Fi adapter, but you also had to had had to provide power to it, so there were cables running all over the place. This thing is really pretty handy uh, because it makes the bore scope completely wireless. So I I do use that adapter when I'm using it with my uh, with my iPhone, but I also sometimes use it with the computer. Depends on if I want the big screen or if I just want something real quick and dirty. It's amazing how often I use the bore scope. It's not it's not only for cylinders anymore. I use it for all sorts of things that where I want a closer look at something. Hmm. I used it, you know, just recently to when I was timing magnetos and I wanted to get a really good look at the at the timing marks on on the the crankshaft ring gear and uh, sticking the bore scope into the into the little viewing port gave me just this huge magnified image and I could get the timing just spot spot on. It was really great. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, William wonders, um, would you see higher EGTs if there is a valve leakage? Yeah, there's some evidence that you that you do um, that because the, 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 a little bit of this very, very hot gas is leaking out um, during a period when really no gas should be coming out, you you won't you won't see dramatically uh, higher EGTs because the quantity of gas that leaks out of a leaky valve isn't very much, but it is very hot. And and the EGT is kind of weird because you've got you've got this uh, 
thermocouple probe that's that, that's reporting EGT that's sitting a couple inches outside the exhaust port, and two thirds of the time it, it it isn't seeing anything because the valve is closed, and then one third of the time it's seeing a very rapidly changing uh, gas temperature going by because when when the exhaust valve opens, the first gas that comes out is very hot, but it ke it keeps getting cooler and cooler. Uh, and and so it's trying to integrate all of this and, and settle down at some equilibrium temperature, and that's the temperature that's getting getting reported as as EGT. It's not really a gas temperature. It's kind of a a strange integral of a rapidly changing temperatures. Um, so if there's a little leakage past the exhaust valve, it does it does appear that that it it increases the temperature of the probe a little bit, but not very much because the, the quantity of gas that that gets past the closed valve, even when it's leaking a little bit, isn't isn't a very large quantity. Well, Mike, just excellent presentation. Several people have just chimed in here. Thank you so much. Uh, great presentation. So so useful of the information. Uh, looks like we had about uh, 600 and well, 80 people maybe logged in tonight. So a really nice crowd. Great uh, set of questions, everyone. Thank you so much. Mike, take a moment and share closing thoughts with everybody. Yeah, it was a really good Q&A session. I always appreciate it when uh, when the people are that engaged that, that we, we have a spirited Q&A session like that. Mm. Uh, just a, you know, a couple of things. If, if you're not on my email list already and you want to get on it we send out a, a, a monthly newsletter and then every week or two we send out an interesting maintenance story of something that happened to one of our clients and and, and how we got it resolved um you can um you can text the word savvy s-a-v-v-y to 33777 on your smartphone and uh, you'll get an answer from a little email bot that'll ask you for your name and email address and it'll put you on the list. Or you can do it at the SavvyAviation.com website, or or you can stick around and uh, when Tim puts up the post-webinar survey, there'll be a little checkbox that you can check that says you'd like to be added to our email list. And everything we send out always has an unsubscribe link. So if you if you have subscribers remorse, you can always take yourself back off the off the list, but I think you'll find the stuff we send that'd be pretty interesting. Um, my my books are available where wherever fine uh, aviation books are sold, uh, Amazon, uh, Aircraft Spruce, or the EAA bookstore. Uh, and usually um, they, they 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 put them on sale at the EAA bookstore uh, during um, uh, during Air Venture, so keep an eye out for that. We've got a podcast uh, that I do along with uh, my colleagues, uh, Paul Newen and uh, Colleen Sterling, um, that, that uh, is a once a month uh, po podcast. It's basically kind of a call-in show where where we take the questions from uh, from aircraft owners about all kinds of maintenance topics and uh, try to provide uh, good answers and and have a lot of fun in the process. It's kind of modeled after the the, the old um, car talk program on NPR, but this is an, an aviation version of it. So um, you can listen to it uh, wherever you get your podcasts, uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts or whatever. And if you want to be to submit a question to the show and be part of the show, you can. Send your question to podcasts at aopa.org. Ian Twombly is our producer, and if he likes your question, he'll set you up to for to to participate during our next recording session. It's usually about the middle of the month, and the the final product is always released on the first of every month. Upcoming webinars: um, uh, the July webinar uh, is called TBO TBO 5000, where we'll, we'll talk about how we helped a flying club uh, take its uh, Skyhawk uh, engine. Um, they, they came to us when it was approaching 2000 hours and said, what should we do? And we said, well, how's it running? And they said, fine. And we said, keep on trucking and we'll, we'll try to help you take it as far as you can take it. 
and uh, they wound up uh, getting it to about 5,000 hours before they replaced it with a factory rebuilt engine. So we'll talk a little bit about how that how that happened. Well, um, in August, I'm going to uh, I have a webinar called Annual Disaster where I'm going to talk about a, a really 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 terrible experience that a very sophisticated aircraft owner had. Uh, with a shop that he had not used before. And there's, well, I think, a lot of lessons learned from that one. This is why I'm going to do it. And then in September, uh, the webinar will be a little bit different. It'll be called What Price Speed? And uh, it's going to talk about um, uh, how to operate engines, uh, and operate aircraft and, and their engines in, a, in the most fuel efficient possible fashion. I thought that was a timely topic, given the fact that Avgas has been going through the roof. Oh, I have a funny story. I I was flying to uh, uh, to Indiana to, over Memorial Day weekend, and I I stopped in Dumas, Texas, because they had what seemed to be the lowest Avgas price in the country. They were selling hundred low lead for five dollars and thirty five cents a gallon. I said, Wow, I got to stop there and buy some of that stuff. Because I use a lot of fuel in my in my twin Cessna, and so I was commenting to the to the guy that that I thought he probably had the lowest fuel price in the country, and he said, "You know, I've got to order some more, and I just hate to do it because <laughs> he knew that the next batch of fuel he he, he bought was going to be a whole lot more expensive. And apparently, this was fuel that he had he'd ordered back before the the price increase, and that's why he was selling it at such a, a low price." But at any rate, um, so that's all. I, that's all I have, and uh, I hope to see all of you uh, next month. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for this great presentation, and uh, really looking forward to next month. And uh, boy, five thousand hours out of an engine—that's uh, that's going to be neat to listen to. So, looking forward to that. Thank you so much for the presentation tonight, and to everybody who tuned in tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope you can join us next week. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Uh, good night, everybody.